Well, good morning, everyone. It's a pleasure to be here. Um, we will be presenting Making the Jump, How to Take a Ch Chance, How Taking a Chance Can Change the Lives of Commercially Sexually Exploited Youth in Your Community. I am joined by um, two fantastic colleagues, Janet Casper and Joanna Lycon. I am the Associate Administrator for the Child Sex Trafficking Team, but I previously worked at TASA with Laramie and worked on um, this conversation around serving rape crisis centers and equipping them to serve um, trafficking survivors, specifically CSA, um, CSA youth, commercially sexually exploited youth. Janet, do you wanna introduce yourself? Sure, thanks, Kara. Hi, I'm Janet Casper. I'm with the governor's office on the child sex trafficking team as well. And I am the East Texas Regional Advisor, uh, which basically means I have the privilege of uh, serving out in East Texas to help implement um, the strategies to um, respond to commercial sexual exploitation. So good to be with you here today. Joanna. Hi everyone, my name is Joanna Licon and I am the lead advocate with the San Antonio Rape Crisis Center and I provide direct services to our youth. Awesome. Well, our objectives today, we want to recognize the need for specialized advocacy for youth who are commercially sexually exploited. Um, we use the term CSA to describe this population. You will hear it a lot during this presentation. We also want to understand the components of the CSA advocacy model and how it can be implemented within sexual assault programs. And Janet's going to lead us through that in um, a very robust way. So you'll have no questions around CSA advocacy um, or, or what those entities do. Learn how to navigate and overcome challenges from a center that's already doing the work. Joanna is going to help us and that part of our objectives. And then we're going to close by identifying next steps to developing CSA advocacy. So say you go through this presentation and your center has been interested in doing an additional level of work to meet the needs of this um, population. We'd love to share what you, what you can do next to, to get closer to that goal. So let's just cover the problem quickly. I know that many of you have been through human trafficking trainings of some kind, and this is not new information, but before we can really understand why we need a specialized service, we need to understand what our circumstances in Texas as we relate to trafficking. So human trafficking is the business of stealing freedom for profit. It is the exploitation of men, women, and children for forced labor, or for sex for the benefit of a third party. The definition of child sex trafficking under Texas law. So in Texas, it's important to understand that multiple parties may be complicit in a trafficking case, not just who we may consider to be the primary bad actor or trafficker. A person that traffics a child by any means, not just force, fraud, or, or coercion, but any means causes them and causes them to engage in or become the victim of commercial sexual exploitation is guilty of trafficking. You may also have people that knowingly benefited from a, a traffic instance of trafficking, such as a business. Can I pause you for just a moment? Yes. I don't know if the PowerPoint is showing. You know what? You are correct. My apologies, everybody. I was just having a lovely little presentation um, with myself. Okay. Thank you. Thank you. Okay, so I ran through our objectives and our problem statements. And here is a visualization of child sex trafficking under the Texas law. We'll provide these slides so you'll be able to look at this later and, um, and look through the Texas Penal Code as well. But here in this blue box at the bottom um, shows the elements of a trafficking offense under, Texas, under the Texas Penal Code. So you've seen three main features. First is the action of trafficking. That could be transporting, enticing, 
harboring, otherwise obtaining, um, otherwise obtaining a person by any means. Then you see the causes or the mean through force, fraud, or coercion causes the trafficked person to engage in commercial sexual exploitation. What's important to know is that in Texas, um, for minors under 18, there is no requirement to show force, fraud, for force, fraud, or coercion to be present in an instance of trafficking for it to be trafficking. That's not the case for adult sex trafficking cases and labor trafficking cases, both of minors and of adults. Those are required to show force, fraud, or coercion. So how big is the issue in Texas? Texas is among the top five states for the highest concentration of human trafficking in the US. Um, we are, we make up almost a third of the calls to the National Human Trafficking Hotline in Texas alone. This is in part due to consistent anti-trafficking work that's done. We have a lot of anti-trafficking efforts in the state. Um, we also have a large population and we have major points of transit. So we have major highways, um, busing facilities, et cetera. But still Texas, despite our high numbers, ranks highly for our protective efforts in combating trafficking nationwide. We're going to show an animate here this is a short film from the Karen Purvis Institute, or short um, animate, about three minutes, um, that visualizes the impact of trafficking on individuals and our society. Well, it seems that that video is not working at present. We'll try again, maybe towards the end when we transition, um, but we'll send the links to this as well so that we can reference, um, free to reference at another time. Here we go. All right, so I just want to recap why this is important for um, sexual assault agencies, domestic violence agencies, traffickers and abusers, um, and the experience of victimization has intersections across all of these areas. Um, for traffickers, they exploit the effects of trauma that survivors and victims have experienced in their homes and in previous abusive relationships. Sounds pretty similar, right? For those that are working in the sexual assault domestic violence fields. Um, using sexual violence as a tool. Perpetrators of sexual assault also frequently prey upon vulnerable populations and utilize um, those things which are most important, weaponize those against us um, as a means of power and control. Um, and while there's commonalities around the, the type of perpetrators and the nature of perpetration, um, there's also commonalities around survivor work and healing, working through things like the stages of change model. Um, so there's, while in many ways we're siloed in these fields, there's actually, um, the experience of survivors is, is not siloed, right? They, they intersect within all of these spaces. Janet. All right. Thanks, Kara. So I'm going to talk with you about the Texas response to child sex trafficking. Um, <clears throat> so if, if you could go ahead and move to the next slide, please, Kara. So I want to talk with you about the child sex trafficking team just a little bit, who we are, why we're here in this space. Um, we, we were created out of legislation back in 2015 to provide a coordinated response to address child sex trafficking. And so our vision for our state really is to be a state where children and youth are free from sexual exploitation. And we realize that is a really big goal, uh, but uh, we, we dream big. 
in, in Texas, right? We always like to say in Texas, we do everything big, right? We're a big state, we dream big. And, you know, we really want to do our very best to, see, to do what we can to um, protect our children from this horrible crime. And so how do we do that? And so our mission statement really outlines what we're doing as a team to uh, work towards that vision. So we really look to build sustainable capacity, enhance expertise, promote policies, create new and leverage existing collaborations to prevent exploitation um, so that we can help our survivors heal, but it's not enough for them to be recovered and heal. We want them to thrive. Uh, we really, really care about their long-term healing and the ability to have um, their life back and have a, a life better than they could have ever imagined. And uh, we definitely want to see exploiters brought to justice and, and actually anyone who's benefited from their exploitation brought to justice. Next slide, please. And so we have um, five goals on our team represented here and this star. Uh, and, and as you can see here, they're based on our legislative mandate and they are uh, children and youth centered. And so we really want to have a very comprehensive holistic response in our state to this issue. So, so we are working on things to protect children in the first place from ever falling um, prey to exploiters. But then we also know we need to recognize it as you saw some of the stats that Kara shared with us a little earlier. Um, there is, there's estimated to be a really high number across our state that are being exploited and we need to recognize it and uh, do a better job. We have a lot of strategies around that, which um, I hope you join um, our web, our, view our website at some point. We're not gonna focus on that today, um, but we are going to talk about uh, recover today and support healing are our main focus for this talk today, but we have strategies in recovering and supporting their Hillary healing. And then we also have strategies around bringing justice. Next slide, please. So let's talk about recover a little bit. And as you see here, we have a quote from a survivor. Um, we, one of our guiding principles on our team is to be survivor informed. Um, all of our strategies, the things that we do, we really want to hear from survivors. And, and what we've heard from survivors is that in the recovery process, you can see this quote here, what your trafficker tells you is exactly right. No one cares about you. They think you are the criminal. Because unfortunately, historically, in our state and, and just actually across the states in general, um, we've not really understood what sexual exploitation looks like and um, trafficking looks like. And, and we unfortunately criminalize the victims. And we know that in our response, we have to do something different. <clears throat> so I'm going to talk with you uh, about our response. And I'm going to give you an overview of two areas of our response, basically um, <clears throat> focused on care coordination and CSA advocacy. Next slide, please, Kara. So one of the things that are, what we learned when we began to do this work and really actually what Governor Abbott, Abbott knew was that services were very disjointed which is, is why he uh, really uh, asked the legislators to be able to have a coordinated response and asked for a team. And so these are actual quotes from parents and from youth. And as you can see here, um, it was a very disjointed system. Um, you guys are, are working in social services, you know how hard it can be to navigate systems and to get support for those that you are fortunate to serve. Um, well, it's the same with this. And so we knew that we needed to create something that was gonna coordinate that. Um, next slide. So that's why we developed one piece of our model called care coordination. And with care coordination, we're really focusing on um, having a strong multidisciplinary team to really ensure that our survivors don't fall through the cracks. So you can see our little visual here, you know, the, the brick with the mortar. And, um, and, and so this to us really visualizes care coordination and, and, and you see the little, gosh, the, the little tool putting the martyr, smoothing the bricks, filling in the blanks. That's, that's really what our care coordinator does. And um, as you look at this, you see all of the different um, teams 
that are part of these services. So law enforcement, prosecutor, placement providers, care coordinator, CPS, juvenile probation, um, and then CSA advocacy and the others. Um, and so care coordination is our way to um, bring everyone together to work very closely with each individual survivor as they come to care coordination for services. Next slide. So our, our model for the recovery and the support healing uh, really has these components, kind of these four components. So you have that, that CSA, commercially sexually exploited youth care coordinator. And so they act really kind of as the air traffic controller. Um, they are coordinating with all the different um, partners in the space. And then you have the CSA advocate, which I'm gonna take a deep dive in um, just a minute, but, but they are the ones that are really supporting that youth um, very intensely. Um, and then you have the care coordination team, that's that multidisciplinary team, um, and, and they are working collaboratively uh, to support this child. And then you have a CSA care coordination advisory council. And so that is the leadership of those teams to help provide oversight and problem solve, help to um, uh, remove gaps and barriers in the continuum of care to ensure that everything is running smoothly. So that's kind of our model for recovering and support healing in a nutshell. One thing I did wanna say too is that with care coordination, we have two goals that we really feel um, should have equal value. Uh, one being um, do no harm to the survivor, support the child, the youth, um, and, and provide strong, robust care. But we also want justice. We want justice for them. And so um, they are both equally important. And um, we, we cannot, we, we really don't want to seek justice at the expense of harming um, the, the youth and the child that is receiving services, but we, we don't want to neglect the justice piece. And so um, that, that makes for interesting balance sometimes trying to make that work, but that is what we strive to do. Next slide, please. So we do have uh, some care coordination teams across State. Um, so you can see here by this map, we currently have 16 that are up and running. And I do want to say, um, just make a distinction here. They are listed by county, but many of these um, care coordinators, that's, that's the hub where they're located. They're children's advocacy centers in these counties that are acting as the care coordinator with the exception of Harris County. Um, that is uh, Children and Youth Services Triad and, and Harris County that plays that role. Uh, but some of them serve multiple counties. So uh, just, just wanted to kind of make that distinction. Um, next slide. Um, and so we have, you know, as a part of our model, as I said, we have care coordination that is providing intense support, navigating, uh, those spaces, as you saw that challenge earlier, um, it, it's overwhelming to know how to navigate. And so a care coordinator does that navigation and, and provides support for that child and that youth, uh, but they do it really through the CSA advocate. Now I want to talk with you a little bit about why we have decided in our state to, to raise up another advocate. We have a lot of advocates in our state, right? And all of these advocates across our state are very important and do great work. But I, I'm gonna share with you a little bit about the challenges that we see that we know exist in working with this population and uh, why we chose to address those challenges to best support the youth um, through CSA advocacy. So let's talk about the trauma. Um, so this slide right here, I don't know if, if you have seen this or not, but um, this is a picture uh, that was taken out in the wild and it went viral really, really quickly when the photographer posted it. And there were a lot of comments that were saying things like, oh my goodness, that, that mother that 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 deer absolutely must be a mother and look she's sacrificially sacrificially giving herself um 
for her, her babies, because obviously those cheetahs are out there to eat those babies and she's sacrificing herself. Well, the photographer was quick to um, reply to those comments and say, no, actually there weren't any babies. She was just frozen. <laughs> she was frozen with fear. And so the reason I, I show this with, to you is because it's a really good example sometimes of that, um, or it's a great example of that freeze response that we see a lot in um, trafficking survivors. And unfortunately, because uh, of that freeze, that freeze response, it actually can cause them to appear complicit with their trafficker. Um, and, and so I think it's important that we remember that because when we um, work with this population, sometimes it's, it's, or a lot of times it can be really difficult for us to understand why are they just being compliant? Why are they going along with everything that the trafficker wants them to do? And so it's important for us to, to remember that that's just a normal trauma response um, to this particular crime. Next slide, please. And then, you know, uh, the other thing that I think it's important for us to understand as we uh, work to serve this population and create our model is that even when survivors are ready to help, Trauma makes it really, really difficult um, to give them help and for them to receive the help. As you saw in the earlier slide, I talked specifically about the freeze response, but there's also that fight, that flight response, and then that, that submit response. And so um, as you can see on the slide, there are several different bullets that talks about some of the uh, the uh, responses that survivors have. Um, definitely triggered by authority figures. And so that's why uh, sometimes when law enforcement or child protective services or other people that represent authority to them, you, you may often see that, that fight response. Um, and that's normal. Um, and, and, you know, as you can see here, there are all these things um, Difficulty regulating effective impulses such as anger and self-destructiveness, disassociative episodes, difficulty trusting people or feeling intimate. Those are all the results of trauma. And we need to take all of these things into consideration when we began to work with these survivors. And we certainly took that into consideration as we designed the model. Next slide, please. And so Oftentimes when we uh, have the privilege of working with someone who's experienced trauma, um, we see a lot of the things on the surface. We, we can see um, their behaviors and, and the behaviors oftentimes are those triggers, the response to triggers, and that can be confusing for us and it can make it difficult for us to help them. But, but I really like this picture here because I think it's a really good illustration of, of looking beneath the surface, the surface. So as you look at this iceberg here, you see on the surface, you see this, this big mountain of ice, right? And the water, but below it, 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 it runs very deep. And um, there's a lot of stuff going on under there that, uh, that would be surprising right? if we could see under the surface. And so I would just encourage you all as you work with those who've experienced um, intense trauma to, to really do your best to look below the surface, to really kind of understand uh, what may be going on on the inside um, because sometimes we just see the surface and, and we, we really don't understand and we can be frustrated um, because some of those, you know, those trauma responses aren't always really pleasant, right? And so um, this slide here really depicts some of the things that are really going on. Um, overwhelms their ability to cope. Um, they uh, have very real or perceived threat to life. Uh, bodily integrity or sanity, you know, they could be in a very safe place. They could be in a shelter where it's been secure and you know that they're safe. But for them, you know, it, it may not feel safe. There, there are triggers there that happen. And so we really need to, to do our best to really kind of understand that. Next slide. 
And so many of them have experienced complex trauma, um, even you know, prior to their sexual exploitation. And um, so this slide uh, really talks about the layers of trauma. You know, complex, tra complex trauma is simultaneous sequential child maltreatment. Um, and so here you can see the different types of abuse. And so when one experiences um, simultaneous abuse, then that becomes complex trauma, which makes one even more vulnerable uh, for increased risk of trauma exposure later in life. And, uh, and so certainly those who have experienced maltreatment uh, at younger ages are, are very vulnerable to commercial sexual exploitation. Um, and then those who have uh, been sexually exploited are traumatized often multiple times um, in one day. So we're talking about very, very deep layers of trauma and that needs to be taken into consideration uh, when we serve them. It, it oftentimes is even more intense than um, someone who, who may have experienced one or two traumas. It's, it's, it's just more intense. Next slide, please. And so I, I really like this particular slide because I, I think it really helps us understand the complex responses that are associated with trauma. Uh, with traumatic stress. And so if you take a minute and you look at this slide, it really illustrates for us, you know, how the brain and the body are connected. This slide is a picture of what happens in the body as a result of complex trauma. Bodies are equipped with capacities to tolerate stress and to regulate. Um, the smooth gray line here represents the body's ability to rally adrenaline when needed and to release cortisol and other hormones to calm down. So that would be, you know, that's normal. Our, our brain, our body just does that for us and it helps us to cope. Um, this happens as needed as people in, navigate stresses. However, when the brain and the body are saturated with traumatic stress response, things become dysregulated. And we see something more like the, the red line that's represented here. And this red line depicts emotional dysregulation, which can bounce back and forth between over aroused and under aroused, or it can get stuck in one of these modes. Over aroused looks a lot like, um, as you can see here, um, all the things, anxiety, panic, hyperactivity, exaggerated. I, I'm sure you all have seen this and uh, many of the, uh, clients that you work with in your organization. And then the under aroused, they can get, uh, look more a little bit as being depressed, uh, looks like flat effect, lethargy, uh, all those things. And then going back and forth, up and down, actually looks a lot like bipolar disorder. And so, um, next slide. And, and so then the other thing that's really important to understand is the trauma bonding that happens between the traffickers and their victims. And I, I know that you guys understand uh, a lot about trauma bonding, I'm assuming, because of the work that you do already. Um, but I just really like this particular illustration because it really helps us to understand how strong that bond is. Uh, a lot of times when people think of... Um, human trafficking, you'll see images of like people with, with chains on their wrists and maybe their mouth gagged. And, um, and certainly that does happen. I mean, certainly there are people with uh, actual physical chains that are holding them there. But most often what happens are those invisible chains. And, um, and so these exploiters are really, really good at making that trauma bond really, really strong because they know then that there's that emotional um, attachment that um, is very, very difficult to break. So they use things like isolation, um, intermittent good and bad treatment, uh, perceived kindness, perceived inability to escape, and then eventually, you know, the, the destruction of self to where the, the person who was being exploited 
really begin to doubt themselves and to feel like maybe this is something they deserve. They'll never be able to leave that perceived inability to escape. I'm stuck here. Um, but yet they're bonded because um, they, they are very good at, even though they've done some really horrific things to them, um, they, they've shown them a little bit of humanity. And so it's really confusing for that survivor to, to see them as completely bad. Next slide. And then as Kara mentioned earlier, there's the stages of change um, that we have to take into consideration uh, in our response to support um, this population and really anyone, right, who is needing to make some changes. Um, so there's that pre-contemplative stage of change to where they may not realize um, that um, what is happening to them is not okay. Uh, maybe they're struggling. They're not. They're not really feeling happy. But surely, you know, they're. They don't need to make any changes themselves. I, I really liken it to kind of like food. Uh, I have a relationship with tacos. I really love tacos. And um, sometimes, you know, I have a problem where my jeans are a little too tight. And and I'm thinking, surely they're cheap jeans. I threw them in the dryer. I shouldn't have dried them. Um, I, you know, it's, it's not my fault. It's the jeans. They're cheap. But then, um, then what happens sometimes my, my other pair of jeans or my other pants or my shirts get a little tight too. And then I'm like, Ooh, I know those weren't cheap and I didn't dry those. Maybe just maybe it's, it's the amount of tacos that I'm eating. And so, you know, that's kind of that contemplation stage, like, Maybe there is a problem. Maybe I should do something differently. And so then, you know, I, I like, okay, well, let's, you know, let's maybe eat less tacos. Maybe I'll eat, um, instead of having two tacos a day, maybe I'll eat one taco, or maybe I'll just only eat them three times a week or something like that. And so I'm preparing to a strategy. And then, you know, I, I start working that strategy. I'm in that action phase of change. And, um, and then eventually my clothes fit again. And then I've decided, you know what? I like that my clothes are fitting again. So I'm going to keep these behaviors because these are working for me. But then something happens and, you know, I'm, I'm out with my friends and they're having tacos and I already had tacos, but I'm going to eat some more or, or whatever happens, right? I'm, I'm really simplifying it, but it's, it's hard to make changes, right? Because sometimes we're ambivalent. We want two conflicting things at the same time. I, I want my clothes to fit, but I also want to eat tacos. Well, when, when you look at uh, how hard change is, just imagine how hard it is for someone who is so bonded with their abuser. And like it or not, those abusers, abusers are meeting some of their needs. They are providing some of their basic support. They are providing some of those things that they need. And so it's really hard for them to change. And oftentimes when we um, work with, with various populations who need our help, we just expect them to come to us in that prepared and action and stage of change and to stay in that maintenance change forever. But we know that in order for our response to support them, we have to take into consideration that they're gonna go through these stages of change and they're probably going to run. They're probably going to get dysregulated. They're going to go back to their trafficker. And we need to plan for that. And we need to have a, a response in our toolbox, so to speak, to be able to address that. Next slide. Um, we also know that uh, sexual exploitation um, produces a trauma that's really, really difficult to overcome. And uh, as you can see here from this quote from Dr. Cross with the Karen Purvis Institute of Child Development, it says the reason why the trauma caused by child sexual exploitation is so deep and difficult to overcome is because it corrupts one of the primary methods humans have to stay healthy and heal from hurt, intimate trusting relationship, which making it very difficult for victims to trust and form meaningful relationships which are essential for their healing. So they have been really hurt and really manipulated through relationships. And uh, we know that the way that they're going to heal is to break that trauma bond, break that rope, and let them have a, a trust, 
trusting relationship, an intimate trusting relationship that is healthy and is going to break that bond and move them towards stability and, and whole, holistic healing. Next slide. So given their trauma, given all the challenges in serving this population, we knew that we had to have um, something in place that was going to be very robust, that was going to address every one of those things. And so that's why we have commercially sexually exploited children and youth advocacy, that big word that we call CSA advocacy. And so let's talk about what CSA advocates do. Um, well, first I will tell you, uh, this is where we have CSA advocates across our state. Um, they are providing crisis response, long-term supportive relationships and case management. And it's all based in trust-based uh, trust relationships. And so as you can see here, we have them in various um, communities, areas across our state. We have approximately 75% of our state's population uh, covered with CSA advocacy. And we're really, really excited about that. Uh, next slide. Um, they meet youth where they are. So when we talk about kind of the stages of change, they meet them in every, uh, wherever they're at, um, emotionally, but also physically. Um, so usually within 90 minutes of a recovery by law enforcement, they are on scene um, wherever it is law enforcement needs them to come to. Typically, um, the safest place for them is to, to go ahead and meet them at the hospital where you all may have encountered them if you're a, an advocate and you, you tag team there. Um, and then these are the things that they do, provide for the basic needs, establish a non-judgmental supportive relationship. Statistically, we learned that um, it's very important that these advocates are able to meet them immediately in their time of crisis, because when they do, they tend to have a, a stronger bond and to have a more successful relationship. So that's why they respond so quickly. Uh, next slide. And so I, I, this slide I, is really important to, to understand that these advocates are designed to have that intense relationship, but also to fill gaps across systems. As I mentioned earlier, we are fortunate to have many types of advocates in our state. Um, but I, I just want to point out here that these advocates are not designed to take the place of another advocate or compete with another advocate. Um, these advocates um, are really here to provide that extra layer of support. And as you look by this, uh, at this slide, you'll see that the, the way we're set up with advocates in our state is we do have advocates um, that serve them, but, but usually once they leave that system, then um, they're, they lose that advocate. So we wanted something that can be consistent for them. Next slide. And then these advocates are really designed to meet them wherever they are at in their stage of change. So if they're thinking they just want to eat lots of tacos and their genes are tight, then the advocate's going to just be there and support them. Or more realistically, if they're thinking this trafficker is my boyfriend and I love him, the advocate's going to listen to them. And the advocate's going to maybe have conversations with them like, well, how's that working for you kind of thing, right? But, but they do not have to be at that action stage of change uh, to be able to get these services. Uh, when they run, um, you know, the advocate's going to be there when they get back. And what we're seeing is that um, they are beginning to run less. And when they do run, they stay in contact with the advocates, but I'm not going to talk all about that because you have an expert who's going to tell you all kinds of great things about what that looks like. Next slide. And then I just wanted to show this to you kind of as a, not to overwhelm you because this is a very busy slide. But there's a lot going on here. But, but basically um, uh, for those of you who may not know much about care coordination, if you don't have that in your community, um, care coordination is, is very uh, complex. And, and so we work with children's advocacy centers and all the different disciplines, the MBT partners, and really map out protocols, 
uh, response protocols so that when a child is recovered or a youth outcries, there is a very coordinated response. And so this is just kind of an overview of what that looks like. And as you can see, you have that care coordinator and you have the CSA advocate by those arrows at the top, those top two lines. They are a part of the process every step of the way. And then you have others that kind of come and go and, and are part of it. I do want to point out, if you do not have care coordination in your community and you do not have a CSA advocate in your community uh, and you really want to consider doing CSA advocacy through your center, you do not have to have care coordination developed to be able to do CSA advocacy. Um, so I just kind of wanted to put that out there and you'll hear more about that actually both from Kara and then you'll hear more from, from Joanne. So thank you so much for your time. I think my time is up, so I'm gonna pass the baton. Thank you, Janet. So that set us up very well to talk about what CSA advocacy can look like in a sexual assault program, a rape crisis center or a dual rape crisis center domestic violence agency. Texas has limited resources and we have a large piece of land that we call home. And so um, resources in general tend to gravitate towards larger population areas. Um, and that leaves our rural counties sort of coming, coming last to the table in a lot of instances across a lot of disciplines. Um, this, the couple of maps here show you a population map up um, in blue, and then below that, you see the National Human Trafficking Hotline heat map. And uh, while there are some, the major cities that, that um, correlate to these population areas, while the heat map shows, um, reflects the population sizes in our state, it also reflects where resources and reporting are, well, where reporting is happening. And those tend to be in communities that have had more human trafficking outreach and awareness and engagement as a community to address the issue. So um, we have limited resources and yet rape crisis centers, domestic violence agencies, sexual assault programs cover the majority, the vast majority of the state of Texas. If you think about it, well, if you look at it here on the top left, it's pretty incredible how much coverage that service, these services um, entail. So the areas in gray are the areas in which a rape crisis center um, is not serving. So outside of those gray counties, we have sexual assault advocates serving each county in Texas, each of the other counties in Texas. The second map, our CSA advocate coverage, is a CSA advocate, advocate coverage map. So where we have an opportunity now is to see counties that are not being served and then which counties that are not being served by CSA advocates could we potentially incorporate into our own programming to serve those youth through rape crisis centers, domestic violence agencies. Karen, can you um, speak up just a little bit? We have some participants <clears throat> that are having a hard time hearing you. Thank you. I'm so sorry. Okay, I will do my best. <laughs> CSA advocacy and sexual assault programs are also strategically positioned. So these programs have a longstanding history in their communities. There's the respect among community partners and an existing infrastructure for crisis response. 24 right? hour hotlines, um, going to a hospital for accompaniment. Those are pieces that CSA advocates have as a component of their programming. So really the infrastructure exists for sexual assault programs to expand should they um, wish to. This is a quote from the Human Trafficking Resource Manual for Advocates. Our crisis centers have the long-term respect within their community and the internal infrastructure to support staff and survivors with complex needs. They also already engage in frequent interactions with the criminal justice and community systems. You all are um, the experts of your communities and you know the partners and you know the resources or areas where those resources are lacking. Um, Laramie Gormit, who is our uh, facilitator today too, 
Um, she has said that the reality is that our centers are serving trafficking survivors, whether they are being identified and provided services or not. And this puts us in a challenging spot when there's a realization of, wow, there is a, there is a population that has not been served historically um, well or identified. And now the steps that come after that to ensure that that's, the services are made available seem overwhelming or um, like a large burden. And so we may want to put our head in the sand and uh, wish that there was a solution that would, would come, but um, what actually is required is to do some collaborative thinking and working within your community and also assessing if your program might want to expand to serve this population. CSA advocacy and sexual assault programs, I also want to say, are um, distinct. CSA advocacy has that long-term case management component, um, an ongoing relationship with the survivor, and a 24-hour on-call continuing after the initial rapport building. Um, it is a long-term relationship that is is intense and you are also doing a lot of work with multidisciplinary team partners. So they need and require a transition or an adding to a, a sexual assault program requires additional thought and planning how we're going to meet those, um, those other objectives of the CSA advocate. So over the course of the last couple of years, TASA has conducted some questionnaires and lots of meetings of partners and convenings. And um, rather than inundate you with data, I wanted to just share these few pieces. We know that trafficking survivors are seeking services at centers, not just because it makes sense if that's the only resource in a community that a survivor would access services there, but also now we're seeing a growing number of centers saying, yes, actually, we do have trafficking survivors seeking services, centers that are starting to identify the signs. Um, here you see in the top left, um, a vast majority in dark red say, yes, that they serve trafficking survivors. Some are unsure. At a town hall convening um, of 65 participants across right crisis centers and domestic violence agencies, um, we saw that um, several, the majority of people had had some form of trafficking training previously. Um, and we're, you'll see in the next slide, um, asking for additional training. And then uh, in our 2021 funding and capacity survey, we see a vast majority saying, yes, not only are we seeing trafficking survivors come to our center, but we're providing them with services. Um, and approximately 30% of clients um, are human trafficking or identified as human trafficking uh, among a group of 25 rape crisis centers that convened uh, at the end of the last year. So that's a pretty significant percentage of your service population, 30%, if, that 20, if that's accurate across, across agencies. But even as a kind of um, a tool to gauge um, activity across the state, it's helpful. All right, so we also see that in order to feel confident in providing services to trafficking survivors, rape crisis centers are asking for more funding and training and resources. This is a, a, a um, infographic generated out of the volume of, of responses. So funding and training are the largest things that our centers are, or that um, rape crisis centers have been asking for. And then at TASA, there are resources um, in print and uh, in staff to support the efforts to, to identify how to move forward next in serving our population. What do we do when we have a trafficking survivor and we don't have um, a safety plan in place? What does that safety plan look like? Um, the folks at TASA can talk you through that. Um, and then we also have here, a, just a breakdown of resources, key programs in the state. So Children's Advocacy Centers of Texas, as Janet mentioned, they are functioning as care coordinators um, predominantly across the state. Um, 
Our CSA advocate agencies are linked here, um, what Janet has shown you and what I have shown you with that map. And then also a screening tool called the Commercial Sexual Exploitation Identification Tool. And that can be used across disciplines to identify uh, or to screen for um, concern of trafficking. So say you're interested. You're, you and your community have been thinking, wow, we're seeing these kids come through and we don't know how to serve them. And we're wanting to move forward on um, CSA advocacy or to learn more what's needed. We will need an understanding of the needs in your community to know if there's already a CSA advocate agency working, if care coordination has gotten off the ground, um, or if none of that exists. So you can connect in with a regional administrator, a regional advisor with the governor's office, and um, they can direct you from there. You also want to assess staff capacity and funding. We'll talk about funding in a, in a moment. And you'll want to begin utilizing specific training, just having your staff equipped with fundamentals. Um, commercial sexual exploitation identification tool, we call it the CIP, motivational interviewing, trust-based relational intervention, which is called TBRI. And then you'll want to be able to meet the Office of the Governor uh, minimum standards, those presidium minimum standards, which are um, required of CSA advocate agencies. And that's a lot of detail and nuance that you don't need right now, but um, just know that there are standards that you'll have to meet. And so you wanna become aware of those early on so you can plan for how you'll be able to uh, implement those. And then you'll want to have support from partner agencies without everyone being on board as a, this agency is going to be our designated CSA advocate agency, we're, we're comfortable having clients referred to them, vice versa, um, then the system won't work, right? And so in the interim, what can you do? What services can you provide? You can continue to provide sexual assault hospital accompaniment, of course, and identify screen for trafficking. You can look at your internal systems and evaluate, okay, we're not able to do CSA advocacy yet. It's too robust. There's um, too much to it. It's gonna be a longer process, but can we do other things now to better support trafficking survivors. So you could consider extending the length of service provision. You could train hotline staff on how to support someone that calls in and um, presents as a trafficking survivor. There's things that you can do to be building out um, greater support already. And then how do you lay the groundwork for CSA advocacy? This is a little bit redundant, um, but you'll have this in your handout. So taking on that specialized training for staff, connecting with your regional um, administrator advisor from the child sex trafficking team. Oops, getting a little happy on my forwarding the slides here. Um, develop relationships with your regional partners and the screening. Also tra uh, starting to track your trafficking data um, and retain those records. We'll be able to demonstrate the need for services in the area. And then finally develop a funding strategy. So for any organization to be sustainable in their work, you wanna have a strategic fundraising plan that's engaging your board of directors. Um, you can utilize a combination of funding methods. Um, sometimes it's called braided funding. It's advisable to have a development director where organizations can to take on the front of that work. And there's a few other tips here, like utilizing a donor database software, engaging in um, major gift donor programs. So large donations um, or endowments that can be used to support the organization in the future. Um, and to not be, to be in a place of security, right? And you wanna start planning for that initially. Um, all right, so we want to you know, also highlight that there are the various funding streams that exist. There's state funding, there's federal funding, you have private donations, private donors, the social enterprise model, which I'm not an expert on, um, 
but is something to um, certainly look into. And then braided funding, as I discussed before. I would advise getting onto some listservs. You can register with the governor's office with our child sex trafficking listserv and receive newsletters, uh, newsletter updates, um, which will include from time to time funding announcements or funding opportunities. And then this is just a, an easy graphic. It's very simplified um, to, to summarize what we've just talked about. So you can start by asking the question, does CSA advocacy, advocacy already exist in my area? If yes, then we would say, great, build a relationship with that, with that agency and work collaboratively because you will inevitably have clients um, for, that are being served by both agencies. Um, and you want to know each other and to, to build trust. Also evaluate your internal programs. As I mentioned, see what you can be doing now to better support survivors when they come through your system. And then if a, there is a high demand for advocates, what has happened in some communities is the building out and existence of two CSA advocate agencies that serve the same region. And um, Joanne is going to talk about that a little bit more. And then if no, if no CCA advocate agency exists, then your and your organization has the capacity and a desire to create a CCA advocacy program, then I would speak with your regional advisor and begin groundwork. If not, uh, sorry, also you can, um, if your organization does not have the capacity at this time, then to move forward on expanding routine services um, and implementing that HT specific training and adapting policies to better serve trafficking youth. All right, I'll hand it over to you, Joanna. Oh, you're muted. Sorry, I was comfortably muted. <laughs> um, so navigating challenges and finding successes um, insights from the field. And so who are we? We are the Rape Crisis Center from San Antonio, and we provide help, hope, and healing for primary and secondary survivors of sexual assault. We have a 24-hour hotline, um, free and confidential counseling, um, an advocacy program that provides um, advocacy and case management, and then we have a prevention and education team. So um, first, I would like to start off with some statistics like um, about our clients and how over the years um, cases have um, gone up and how our program has grown because of the demand um, needed to provide services for these clients. And so you see in the first quarter, um, we had six clients and then 10, 20, 19, and then it just keeps going up all the way to 72. Um, and then you see a huge drop um, in quarter three between 2020 and 2021. Um, and I'll explain to you um, why that drop um, happened. But also, I would like to give you some statistics. Um, I know we talked about care coordination teams um, and other programs being already CSA advocates in our area. So we work in Bear County, and there was already a CSA advocacy team there as well, who we work close with. Um, and so we've actually established a program to work with them to serve um, our large population and our care coordination team has been amazing to help us navigate through that. Um, but their statistics um, from our care coordination team, which is child safe, um, since 2019, we received 359 clients in care coordination. Um, and in 2021, we had 225 clients enrolled. And out of those 225 clients, 129 were our clients and 102 were common threats clients. Um, and in those statistics, you do see that, you know, some of the clients didn't represent either organization, didn't go with any organization. And that's because there were some challenges within that I will talk about later. So you can go into the next slide. So CSA advocacy. Um, like. In the beginning of our program, uh, we only did 
immediate need case management where we would just provide referrals within the community um, based on the client's needs. So we would go to the hospitals and be their emotional support system and see what is that is it that they was needed to move forward so the survivor could go on their healing process. So if they wanted to come back to counseling, we would refer them to our counseling program, right? But after that, after about two weeks, then we really wouldn't talk to them anymore. Um, and so we decided to eventually implement a long-term a long um, term case management to provide um, the needs that they needed at that moment that nobody else was meeting. So we provide a crisis response team that goes to the hospital or responds when they're recovered. Um, so we're there for emotional support that can last up to from like three hours to five hours. It just depends on what's going on um, in the moment of their life. Then we move on to like their basic needs and their support system. So what is it that, that survivor is needing at that moment and how are we going to meet those, um, those needs? Um, and that is where care coordination sometimes helps um, because we get together and we say, okay, this is what the client is needing. This is what the rape crisis CSA advocacy program is going to provide. Where else do they need that we can't provide? Um, where can we reach out to meet those needs. And so it's a it's a team effort. Um, it's a tri-space relationship, not only with the client, but also with the team um, who understands the needs and tries to reach out and help the advocate kind of meet those client's needs. Um, we also have um, care coordination meetings, which are rapid response team meetings within a certain amount of hours when the client is recovered. And that allows us to kind of see where they're in crisis, um, if we need to, you know, put them in a behavior hospital to make sure that we address those immediate crisis needs, um, that sort of thing. Um, like I said, long-term case management, long goals. Um, are they going to a rehab because there is substance abuse? Um, are they going to um, go into... Um, are they going to go back home with their with their parents? Um, and sometimes in some of those cases, um, our youth unfortunately is exploited by their own family members. And so in these basic needs and these meetings, we talk about where they're going um, and how we're going to provide a safe environment for them. Um, and then in the law enforcement component and the court accompaniment, um, we build long relationships with them. Um, sometimes they do run. Um, and then they come back and they're the ones that reach out to us. Sometimes they don't reach out to law enforcement because um, they're scared of law enforcement for whatever reason, because they're hey, asking. Sometimes I'm so sorry to interrupt you. Yes. Our interpreters are asking if you could slow down a bit. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Um, so sometimes they're scared to come back um, because they haven't had the best um, relationship with law enforcement. And so we're that advocate that comes out to them. And we're like, okay, this is why it's important for you to talk to law enforcement. This is why it's important to kind of proceed with the process. Um, and sometimes they get it and sometimes they're scared and that's okay. We have to meet them where they're at. Um, I've had police accompaniments um, where I meet the client. Sometimes we've had a long um, relationship and I understand who they are. I know who they are. I know what they need. And I can talk to the detective and be like, this is what my client needs prior to the interview, um, just to kind of calm the nerves. Sometimes I don't know the client and I can show up and I'm like, okay, this is what's going to happen in there. We can debrief of what's going to happen and we can debrief afterwards. You know, I know it's scary. I'll be right next to you. I will probably say anything because I don't want to interfere with the law enforcement component, but I'll be here after words if you need me and they know that I'll be there whether I'm in the room with them or they feel comfortable with me being outside the room next slide and Joanna we just had another request for a little bit more time for the interpreters to catch up okay <laughs> um so I'm going to talk about um how we came about in uh, our CSA program um, I've been with the Rape Crisis Center since 2018, since our CSA program started. I started as an intern counselor and then moved on, but I was able to see how our program had developed. Um, and so in 2018, um, funding was made available for CSA advocacy programs to help provide crisis response, basic needs, personal support, case management, and support and justice activities. So when the funding was available, eventually two organizations applied to this 
grant and which was BCFS within our Bear County um, and then our organization. BCFS was already doing case management outside, um, already seeing CSA advocates, CSA clients, um, but didn't have that like hospital component. Our program was already seeing clients in the hospital, but didn't really do that long-term case management. And so this is where we kind of merged the gap because there were some clients that were CSA clients and we didn't really identify because the other way, we didn't have the training or our program didn't serve long-term. Um, and so we came together um, and we talked about how we were going to strategically make a plan for both of our organizations to eventually serve the same population because there were so many clients. So I showed you the statistics earlier um, and there was a need to be made. So at first it was kind of confusing because both organizations wanted to jump in and help, right? Um, and it was a little confusing because each organization had um, their own partners because the community members already knew them um, and that was okay, but we had to find a way to make sure that we were meeting the client's needs without any confusion within our partners. And so eventually um, we came together, Care Coordination, um, BCFS and our organization to kind of sit down and see what we needed to kind of meet those needs. Um, and essentially what we came forward in the very end is that we would go week by week. So one week we would take all our CSA clients. The next week, um, BCFS would take the, the, next, um, the next week, right? We would alternate. And if in the event of you know, someone being sick because it was in the middle of the pandemic or something happened, we agreed to help each other, um, just communicating with each other that we were gonna, um, we were gonna help each other. Um, and so that's how we would do it. We'd communicate to our hotline and say, hey, this week we're gonna cover um, the CSA clients and be like, okay, so they would expect to kind of check their email to see if there was any referrals coming in and expect that um, and not be a little bit confused about why we were receiving so many clients. Um, and then eventually we came across a challenge that we were duplicating clients because we didn't have a common platform to kind of put our clients in, right? So we were receiving them from the community, but then there was multiple referrals coming in. Um, and so we were duplicating the services, um, which became a little bit challenging because the clients sometimes or their parents would be like, well, I already had a referral. I already had an advocate call me, like, who are you with? <laughs> and so that, that became challenging. And so we decided to adapt to a, a program in Bear County, we use um, Signify. And so that allowed law enforcement, um, our agency, BCFS and care coordination to see the clients that we were serving what services we were providing for the client. Um, that way everyone was on board and meeting the goals that the client needed. And so that was very helpful. And in the event that a client was um, already receiving services from two organizations, we would kind of evaluate, okay, who build rapport with them the longest? Like who build rapport already? Um, and what is it that each organization is, is a, like, giving the client, meeting their needs. And if they're both meeting the client's needs and not duplicating any services, then the client would keep both advocates, but it just depended on a case-to-case -case basis. And we can go to the next slide. Okay, so to, um, I kind of talked about some of the implementations because um, there was a lot of challenges. Um, I can say that in the beginning, of our program, I think we had two advocates um, and they just did case management, but eventually when we got our CSA advocacy team, there was only a few. And as our case loads grew, there was a demand for advocates. And so we were able to get more grants to be able to staff our, um, our cases with more clients because our CSA clients um, have a lot of needs that need to be met and that's okay, um, which requires a lot more time for our advocates to spend with them. And so we understood that and we had to do that. Um, we um, implemented MOUs and procedures to make sure that the organizations knew um, what our roles were. Um, we educated the community of if a um, CSA um, client referral would go um, come in, how we were gonna go about that. Um, and the way that we have implemented is that our care coordination team has a human trafficking hotline and if a referral comes in, it would go through them. And based on who had um, 
who was assigned that week, the referral would then go to the hotline uh, that was on that week. Um, and that's how we ended up um, doing it. We implemented a commercial sexual exploitation identification tool. tool. Um, like I said before, when we were going to the hospital, sometimes we didn't even know that there was, you know, risk factors or, um, you know, some things that we weren't aware of that might have been signs of human trafficking. Um, but with this see it tool, we were able to identify if they were a clear concern to human trafficking or they were already identified as a trafficking victim. We implemented our Signify platform within our county um, that reduced duplication within our services. Um, we had a lot more communication with our care coordination team, the other agencies if they were involved, um, and we had a lot more training based on what we were seeing. So uh, trauma-informed care, person-centered, trust-based relationships to be able to meet these clients' needs. Um, so then, like I mentioned before, um, all of our advocates are now CSA advocates. Before, um, we had case managers who would just be um, short-term case management managers, and then some team members would do CSA advocacy, but because of the high demand, we kind of um, cross-trained everyone. Um, we were able to hire more advocates, like I said. Um, all of our advocates are on, under similar grants. Um, to be able to provide these needs that these clients need. Um, I already mentioned long-term case management and let's see. We do re receive monthly reports from um, care coordination um, and it just tells us like how many services we're providing. That allows us to kind of match with our platform to see that we have the same, um, you know, the same data. Um, and one of the challenges that we had that I didn't mention is like data and, and making sure that the clients are um, receiving their needs. There is implementations that we have to meet, like um, Kara and Janet said earlier from the Office of the Governor, there is guidelines. And to be able to meet guidelines, we have to be able to have the right platforms and to be able to have the right, um, you know, that, that demonstrate these numbers. And so we had to make some changes to be able to to show these results, these numbers. And then now our hotline is beginning to be trained to be able to use the CIT tools to be able to identify um, these clients um, and whether they're click concerned so that they can streamline that to the advocate and then the advocate will make the referral. Mm -hmm. Go to the next slide. Okay. So I'm not going to read it straight off the slide because I'm very passionate about what we do and I'm very happy that we've been able to get to the point that we're at now. Um, it's been a long journey and we are still making changes in with our, within our department to be able to meet these clients' needs. We've been able to build relationships with law enforcement, build relationships with other organizations that we'd never build relationships with. We've been able to, because of the amount of staff we have, we've been able to reach out to other organizations and say, okay, what services do you provide? You know, because when you're limited in staff, like, you know, you have your caseload and that's it. But now we're able to expand to other communities and introduce ourselves. We are the Rape Crisis Center. I'm an advocate. What can you do for my clients? Um, what else? Um, we are a CSA advocacy team who, just like any other CSA advocacy team, um, we welcome our clients when they're back. We're like, I'm so glad you're back. We're not like, why did you run away? You know, it's so exciting to hear that they came back or to see that they were able to trust me to text me and tell me, hey, I'm not doing okay. You would think that they would mention this to their parents or stuff or, or anyone close like law enforcement, but no, they're able to reach out to us. And that's very important to us. Um, we were able to build long-term case management. That wasn't the case before. We're meeting a lot of needs that weren't met before, um, and we're seeing successes in our clients. I have a client that was able to go to rehab and now going back to, you know, school and is getting their life um, the way that they want it. Um, we're the advocate that goes to care coordination meetings and we're like, this is what my client needs. I understand that, like, you know, we need to do this because on the law enforcement side, but this is what my client wants. This is what they need to be happy because sometimes they're, they're youth and they don't have a lot of, um, 
guidance in their life or they don't have that person that's guiding them because of the type of exploitation that's happened in the past. And you can go to the next slide. Yeah, there it seems. Yeah. <laughs> oh, I can't hear you, Kara. Hi, Kara um, and Joanna. We just had a question from the audience um, asking more about the see it, the see it tool. I think that somebody already answered in the chat, or maybe you could tell everybody. Yes, Janet answered in the chat. Um, so we do offer training on the see it. Um, our regional advisors conduct those trainings. It's a user training. It allows you to be able to um, screen for. Um, indicators within your agency. And Janet, what would be the best point of contact to reach out? One of our numbers at the end of? You know, actually, what, what works really well is uh, if you go to our website, um, which I think is on the slides, or we can drop in the chat mm -hmm. as well, you can, you can inquire through our website. Um, about the SEA training, and then that will automatically, depending on your location, go to the appropriate regional advisor. They send that to us and then we'll follow up with you. Or if you would like to, you can directly reach out to me or uh, we do have a slide in here that has all of the email addresses of the regional advisors in your area. And you could reach out to any, so there are multiple ways. But, so, but yeah, and, and I will say that it is, it's free to use the tool. Uh, you, you would need to um, have a user agreement with uh, Allies Against Slavery to use the tool in the, the platform Lighthouse. And um, we, we can help you get connected with all of that. And real quick, um, I know I think Kara's trying to see if the video can work. Mm -hmm. I had a question for Joanna um, about confidentiality. We know rape crisis centers and domestic violence shelters have a duty of confidentiality to their clients. How does that work when using Signify um, and communicating with law enforcement? Can you tell them a little bit more about that? Yeah, so we have our own confidentiality um, form initially in the hospital or we'll do it after when we initially meet with our clients, saying that um, we could potentially um, still help them with law enforcement process and communicate with them and be that voice for them. And so they would sign and do that. Um, but throughout the whole entire process, before even communicating with anyone on their case, we would ask for consent, of course, from their guardian um, or from CPS, depending on who their guardian is. Um, and then um, we also have an additional care coordination um, consent form that we have to be able to be enrolled in care coordination. Um, and that allows us to talk to other partners on their case um, on their behalf. Um, and that's why um, I don't think I touched base on it, but our numbers in the last quarter kind of dropped. That's because we were, some of our clients didn't, weren't able to sign consent forms, which didn't allow them to be enrolled in the program of bidding sign consent. Well, since we're a little ahead of schedule, I thought it'd be great to try this video again. This is the um, animate on human trafficking from the Karen Purvis Institute with Texas Christian University. One more time. Human trafficking, commercial sexual exploitation and forced labor seem a world away. But according to the International Labor Organization, there are more slaves at this moment than at any other time in history. UNICEF tells us that of the estimated 40.3 million people subjected to modern slavery and psychological bondage, approximately 70% of those are women and girls, some as young as six years old, with abusers who can range from family members and acquaintances to gangs and persons unknown. How is it possible that something so insidious has become widespread? A recent report by the University of Texas at Austin states that in Texas alone, there were almost 80,000 sexually trafficked youths. What methods could possibly allow victims from all walks of life to be exploited and abused in this way, from the most vulnerable and at-risk to those from privilege? 
The process can be one of violence, including kidnapping, or desperation where sex is traded for food, shelter, or necessities for existence. But often, it's a case of careful grooming, identifying a victim by looking for vulnerabilities. Traffickers target victims with emotional neediness, low self-esteem, and those under stress. By gathering information in an interested way, the goal is to create trust and build dependency while isolating the abused from family and friends. Through phone calls and social media, the trafficker begins slowly, often supplying phones and other devices so that communication can be continuous and undercover. By fulfilling a need, the trafficker strives to become everything to their victim, including becoming the only person they can trust. Often, the dependency building includes gifts, drugs, or alcohol. But sometimes, it's simply the fulfilling of a desperate need to be seen. Once trust is established and dependency is complete, control begins. Often, there's been nothing asked of the victim until this point, when suddenly the threat of violence and sexual demands leave the victim confused, fearful, and psychologically battered. Sexual exploitation and physical abuse create chronic overstimulation of the brain as the threat of violence leads the abused to stay on high alert. The true horror is that even rescued survivors have years of recovery ahead, since recovery requires overriding trauma-related neural pathways that years of victimization create. Sadly, any association with the sex industry creates an unforgiving stigma that both shames and blames the victim. Too often, survivors are treated as criminals as we overlook the process that has created these circumstances and the devastating consequences that can last a lifetime. This must stop. It will take deep understanding and multiple healing strategies in order to help survivors develop needed skills such as self-confidence, problem-solving, and self-regulation. Only in this way can survivors distance themselves from their traffickers, reestablish their identity, and come to believe that they have inherent value. Isn't that just so fantastic? We'll make sure to include the link in resources so that you all can use it in your um, own communities to talk about trafficking should you like. Um, since we are towards the end of our presentation, I just wanted, I think each of us wants to give um, kind of just a statement around this work. Providing CSA advocacy is an undertaking that um, is challenging, but it is, it is the piece, it is the piece that makes response, a re response to human trafficking in Texas work. Um, when a child is traumatized by the system, the only contact that they feel like they can reach out to in a moment of crisis is their CC advocate, that's success. And um, in these spaces where the CC advocacy does not exist, just encourage you that it's worth the work. I'll, I'll share with you guys briefly. Um, this weekend, I was at an event. I was at, um, at the grand opening of a resource center for um, uh, survivors of sexual exploitation and trafficking. And while I was there, I saw someone that I recognized and I just kept looking at her and I'm like, I know her, I know, I know her. And I'm trying to place where I know her from. And so when I had a moment, I went up to her and I just said, do I know you from something? You look very familiar to me. And she said, you know, I was saying the same thing. I looked at you and I'm like, I know her from somewhere. And, and so we were trying to figure out, she goes, well, you either know me from jail or Freedom Place, which is a residential treatment center for um, youth and, and um, girls who had been sexually exploited. And as soon as she said that, I said, tell me your name. She told me her name. And y'all, she was, um, <clears throat> I, I formally, like this was over 10 years ago, about 10 years ago, I was a CPS worker and I had this teenager on my caseload that I cared deeply about. And I was so concerned about because I, I, I look back now and I saw 
she was being trafficked or she was very high risk for being trafficked. And the system, we, we, we couldn't figure it out. And the system was failing her at that time. And, um, and I, I just said to her, I'm your former caseworker. I only had the privilege of working with you for probably about four months. You kept running a lot. <laughs> she said, yes, I remember. And you know what she said to me? She said, you know what, Ms. Janet, as, as I look back on that really hard time in my life, she said, I, I did. I, I ran away and I got, I got recruited. And I've had such a horrible, horrible time, but I, I, I'm doing better now. I, I'm getting my life together. But she said to me, if we would have just had someone who was there with me, like that I could see on a regular basis, because I kept, I got moved a lot. And basically what she did was describe to me CSA advocacy. And I just said, I hear you. And I said, we are working really, really hard to do better. And I told her, I said, I just want you to know you had such a huge impact on me. I did a lot of things wrong. I didn't know. And, um, and, and we are working really hard to do things better. And so I do want to just tell you all, the work that you are doing is incredibly important. And you don't know, you know, you, you don't always get to see the, the, end game, so to speak, the outcome, but, but we do know because survivors tell us all the time that that trust-based relational intervention, that consistency, that support, that asking the questions um, makes a difference. And so I just want to encourage you guys, whether it's through C officially through CSA advocacy or not, um, just keep doing the great work you're doing and, and base it in those relationships um, because that really that, that's what they need. That's what they're wanting. And I'll be quiet now because I could talk about this work forever and we don't have that kind of time. I don't want to bore you. Joanna, I don't want to cut you off. You had something you wanted to share. Yeah, and so I just wanted to share that sometimes CSA advocacy could be a little bit more long-term than when they're children. It could go on to when they're an adult, unfortunately, because they didn't get the right needs. And so that is really important to kind of meet their needs when they're young so that they can, you know, start off um, healthy lifestyles and stuff like that, because it's really hard when they're adults to break those habits. Um, we all have habits um, that we know it's hard to, to break, but we, we try to support them from when they're, you know, teens all the way to when they're older um but yeah those needs somehow they need to be met whether it's by us um, or another organization that's going to meet those needs <laughs> thank you and i know that um we actually did end up running out of time but if you have additional questions um our contact information is in the powerpoint deck that um, will be uploaded for you guys but i'll also throw my email address in the chat if um, Joanna and Janet, you'd like to do that as well. And then Laramie, did you need to talk about evaluations? Yeah, I just want to say, first of all, thank you so much, uh, Janet, Joanna, and Kara. I uh, really appreciate the information and the work that you all do. Um, thank you all for the participants. Please don't forget to fill out your evaluation. There is a QR code right in front of you. Um, you can also put the link in the, the chat box as well. And, uh, you know, like Kara said, that the PowerPoint will be made available to you all. And I believe it'll be available uh, in between July 28th um, and it'll be available until like September 30th, I think. So thank you all so much. We appreciate everything that you do and uh, hope you enjoy the, the next workshop. Thank you.